Hello, I'm Tina Evans, and thank you for joining us. And this, a series brought to you by the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs, called Bermuda Through Our Eyes, where we sit down and have these wonderful conversations with our seasoned saints, our elders, our seasoned elders of Bermuda. And today, I am really delighted uh, to have her with us, joining us today, Dr. Norma Aswit. Uh, hello, Dr. Aswit. Hello. I have great respect for you, and this is quite an honor to be able to sit down with you. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm glad you, glad you consented. So, let's go, let's get at it now, we'll talk about it. Tell me about Dr. Norma Aswood. Growing up in Bermuda, um, what, let's start with parish family. Well, I was born in Hamilton okay. on Ewing Street, okay, you're, which is really back of town. I was about to say you're a back of town girl. I sure am, <laughs> and really happy to have been able to grow up in that neighborhood. Yeah. With, now, back of town wouldn't be considered porn. But they, you know, they say porn dogs, you know, we, we grew up around the porn. That's different, right? Not altogether. Mm, okay. But remember, Parsons Road probably is out of Hamilton, mm -hmm. North Street, mm -hmm. which becomes Parsons Road mm -hmm. just at the junction with Angle, mm -hmm. is really where Hamilton stops. Okay. Okay. So I was born in Hamilton, mm -hmm. but not far from the Pond Dog area, okay. Okay. and certainly went to school yeah. way back of town. Yeah. Uh, around the pond. Around the pond. Around yes. Central. Oh yeah. <laughs> and and you grew up in on Ewing Street and lived with your family. I was the eldest of three daughters. Uh, parents were father from Hamilton, mother from Somerset. So I had a blend of the city and the and the country. And certainly considered myself a city slicker. You were <laughs> not really yeah. related to the country parts. Not not the country parts. Your maiden name was Cox. Cox, right? Okay. Um, tell me, did you visit your mother's family in Somerset? What was oh, that yes. like? Yes. Yeah. And we're still very close. Right. There's I believe I'm the dowager cousin at this stage. I'm about the eldest okay. of the. Mm, yeah, we were Bassets. Oh, the, yeah, okay. And I'm, I think I'm the oldest surviving one of, of the Bassett of clan, the Bassett out clan. of Somerset. Yeah. I'll tell you a story about mm -hmm. going to Somerset to visit family, because as I said, we were very close. And when I was a child, there was a train. And my mother would let me go to Somerset alone on the train at age five. Um, and she would always pin the train stop on whatever outer garment I had on to make sure that the conductor knew where I was to get off, as if I didn't know, of course. Um, and I had a grandfather born in England, uh, married to great-grandma. He would come to meet me, but being a city slicker, I didn't like his transportation. He'd turn up with a wheelbarrow. <laughs> not quite my way of driving. So I learned how to get off the stop before I was supposed to get off the train and wend my way through backyards from Soundview Road to Scotts Hill Road and get back to great grandma's house before grandpa got Before home. grandpa got and, and you were young. I was five. Always, always, I, I, I want to put a word, you were adventurous, you were... Uh, oh yes, curious. Curious, yes. Yeah, all of those kinds all of things. All of those <laughs> Your mother, of course, putting you on the train in town, hoping that you get it to the stop and you getting off the, the stop oh, yes, before. Yes. Well, well, Grandpa soon learned that there was another way of transporting me. Right, you know, right. Just go on foot. Oh yeah, and yeah. walk with Shanks you. pony was yeah. the way of going from one yeah. stop to the other. So now in the city, you talk about growing up in the city, and I mean North Hamilton, back, back of town. Um, 
you were we had more access to transportation. People were using bikes more than, let's say, folks in the in the country. Well, I don't have any statistical evidence right. about right. how they got around. I know my father cycled from Hamilton to Somerset to visit my mother before they married, and he wasn't the only one. A.B. Place lived on the same street. He has a 101-year-old son of Brownlow Place who lived on the same street as us. Um, the two men would often go up to Somerset together. Crossing Somerset Bridge, I gather, was a bit of a challenge. The Somerset men didn't like the Hamilton men coming to take away their, you know, to get wives. But uh, Place and Cox were clearly successful. Each married the women they were planning to visit. What did your mother do? Yeah. My mother was a teacher. Okay. Uh, she taught at a school known as May Stowe's, and there are still some students around that she had taught. Um, and I went to school with the children of some of the people that my mother taught, and I went to Barclay. Where did you do your formal education um, on the primary? Oh, there was only one place if you lived in uh, Hamilton. You well, went to Central. Of course, of course. Go ahead and say so. <laughs> um, and I did Central from 1940, 1937 until 44. I was lucky enough to, well, I don't know whether it was luck, but I skipped one class. So I was a year ahead of some of my peers. Yeah. You, the Central, when you talk with people who went to Central, um, very proud history. Um, and I always amazes me because I'm like, it was such a large school. How were you able to, you know, get that type of quality education and, uh, at Central? But t tell me about your, your time there. Central was large. Um, it had, the year I started, just under 1,100 students. There were 20 classrooms, formal classrooms, and the assembly halls also were used as classrooms. Um, Who was the principal? Victor Scott. And I wish they'd I would in I wish they would include the name Central with Victor Scott because he's associated with Central. Um, but it was very large, the classes were large. I mean, there could be as many as 50 kids in one classroom. Most of the teachers were trained and very able teachers. Very dedicated, uh, good disciplinarians, highly respected by parents and students. Um, I taught there actually for a while after I trained myself because my first career was in teaching. But I think one of the ways in which Central excelled and why the way in which it's so highly respected even today is because we were prepared by the school to anticipate change in Bermuda's certainly racial progress. And I say progress, which has been very slow, but nonetheless, one of the things Mr. Scott always taught from the stage in the assembly hall was, do well in school because change will come and you'll be prepared for it if you do well. And if we look back at some of the senior civil servants from the 70s or perhaps mid 60s, the black ones who became, who moved into senior positions were for the most part graduates of Central School. Um, people like Ken Richardson who became cabinet secretary, John Swan, and we, the list goes on. Um, and who were some of your contemporaries at, at, at Central? Edwina Smith. Edwina Smith, Smith, Smith. Who Edwina. taught at Barclay and became a librarian mm -hmm. afterwards. Eric Jones who became a uh, lawyer, Theodora Anamashan, who passed away recently. She was Theodora Archer. Uh, Helen Somersault Foster. Um, 
at the yeah. door. And, and, and I think that's what, when you talk Central, you talk about some of the people that came from Central, that yeah. came out of Central. It's an amazing, prestigious list of people that were educated there. And despite all the odds that were around to go to school mm -hmm. and to get an education, just persevered and just became amazing. Well, remember, we had the city dump right opposite the school. I mean, the smoke from the dump poured into the classrooms. Um, it was not a healthy place to study. When it rained, the field often flooded. Um, I, don't, I don't know how many people remember, but what became the canal, so to speak, and still causes problems at Mills Creek and about, happened because Mills Creek was opened, you know, a rock was moved. I don't know who thought they could fight against the Atlantic Ocean, but I mean, it was the <laughs> ocean was coming, coming in. Right, coming in, yeah. Um, and it flows all the way, all, all the way to BAA, down through Bernard Park and on to the Central School. Um, some brilliant somebody decided to move yeah. the rock. You, you talked about Victor Scott and you were taught that change would come. What was it like growing up in segregated Bermuda um, for most of your formative years, I guess? Yeah. All of. Yeah. All of. Yeah. Um, it was restrictive. I mean, there were things you couldn't do, places you couldn't go. But I think most of us at Central decided, you know, we had our own clubs, organizations, churches. I'm not sure that all of us even recognized some of the restrictions, primarily because a lot of the things we did were done well. Central, for instance, held elections. Whenever there was a country-wide election for Parliament, we had an election at school. And the election was to elect house captains, and you had to have a piece of property in order to vote, which was similar to Standard what happened with in, what was going in the adult election yeah. process. Uh, and the, what we needed was a reading book. A really good idea on the part of the principal, because you needed to learn how to read. So you had to have this property in order to make that progress at school. So academically, we were encouraged all the way. There were so many things that, that the school set up. Um, even when we left Central and went on to secondary school, there were some subjects that we had already half completed through the secondary, things like grammar. I, I listen to some of the grammar locally now and it, 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 it's a shame that a number of adults have never learnt the grammar that's required for the language. And some of what I hear is almost like a second language. They're not really speaking English. Um, so that we had a teacher named Edith Crawford who was responsible for the teaching of English language. And she would give us paragraphs to parse and analyze and work at. Um, so we learned how the language worked. Unfortunately, a number of young people today haven't had that opportunity. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, like I said, it is amazing to hear folks talk about Central and the quality of education, as you said, from trained, qualified educators. You went, you left Central and went on to Barclay. Yes. Your parents were able, those were the days when you had to pay to go to Barclay. Yes, some mm -hmm. of us had to pay. Um, Central usually was able to win a number of scholarships. Um, I was lucky. The year that I started Barclay, government gave eight scholarships to secondary school, four to blacks. We were then colored rather than black, so there were four to colored students and four to white students. Uh, Mr. Scott threatened that if we didn't win all four at Central, he would eat his hat and give himself up to the Germans. 
which would have been a horrific experience for him. And we wouldn't have wanted to lose Mr. Scott to the war-torn situation. So um, we worked very hard, and he taught us very well. And Sandra won all four. I was one of them. Uh, it was the same year that Barclay uh, had to have a, an entrance exam. It was not the 11th class. class. Right. It was an entrance examination to Barclay because they had so many applicants that they were unable to accommodate all of them. Fortunately, a number of colored, and I say colored rather than black because of the period, uh, men began work at Kindley Field, which was then the U.S. base. Their salaries were much higher than they had earned off base, and they were able to afford to pay the fees. Um, to school. So, so a lot the of more, lot, Yeah, yeah, applied. yeah. We're gonna come back, and I wanna talk about that. I wanna lead into that to talking about you as an educator, and then going on to become a psychologist. Yes. yes. All right, we'll be right back with more with Dr. Norma Aswood. I'm so delighted today to be speaking with Dr. Nora Aswood, um, an accomplished edu ed educator, um, psychologist, former senator, member of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. I'm going to tell you all this. She has a wiki page. Just go ahead and Google her. <laughs> But it's so great to have you here with us today. You know, we left off and we were talking about Central and then off to Barclay. But um, I really want to talk about what, what motivated you to, you know, go off and when did you go off for educated to become a teacher? Mm. Uh, 51. Yeah. What, what was the motivation? What was, what was the push to go to? Well, remember in, in 51, there weren't a lot of opportunities mm. career-wise for blacks. And education was one that many chose, particularly females. Um, in addition to segregation racially, there was also the distinction between male or female. Nowadays, women are in medicine and law and business, whereas back then, you didn't find very many. Additionally, of course, there was the whole cost of becoming a professional. So education was chosen rather than nursing at that time because I found that if I had become a nurse, I was relegated to a small hospital. I could not practice nursing at King Edward, for instance. So education became a place where I could work, I could teach, I could work with children, I could help children to become the kind of adults that Bermuda needed. And so, education. Yeah. yeah. And you worked in the, the ministry or the department for the return to Bermuda and worked there? That was much later. When I finished teacher's college in Canada, I went on to do my first degree, which I did in psychology and, and literature. Uh, and I came back to Bermuda and taught. I went to England for a year because I was hovering towards doing psychology, College, you were. which had been highlighted during my training as a teacher. Mm. And I quite liked it and did very well mm. in the subject. So you taught for 20 years, if I, if I read right. correctly, and then decided to go on and do psychology. Correct. Mm. Tell me about that. Why the transition? Um, well, you said you were always interested in it coming yeah. through college, yeah. but did you see a need for it? Were there other trained black psychologists at that point? There was one other. Uh, Millard Bean worked at um, King Edward for a short while, but I was the first doctoral level Bermudian psychologist. Um, I, f I finished in 74, and at that time worked in the Department of Education because I was based there um, with some responsibility for school counselors. Um, 
we met last year actually and reminisced on some of the things that happened during that time. It was a, a growing experience, I think, for all of us and for, certainly for Bermuda. It was an enormous job because I was the only one. Um, they now have about six. Um, so back then, let me say 70, we could always talk about all the social, political implications that were going on during the time. Mm -hmm. um, children in the private, in the public school system. Um, what were some of the challenges, I guess, you would see from a psychology um, perspective and during that time? Well, because I was the only one most of the time I was there. Behavioral? Or? There were behavioral problems. Mm. We, we concentrated a lot on learning disabilities. Ah, okay. Uh, helping children who were having difficulty in, mm. at school, generally. Yes, we saw some behavioral problems. I worked very closely with the psychiatrists and psychologists at St. Brandon's as well. It was St. Brandon's at that time, it's now Maui. But we were able to do a number of things that had not previously been done. For instance, um, once a year, towards the end of the school year, along with the senior education officer for special ed, who was Victor Garcia, uh, we met with the school nurse or school nurses. Uh, we met with the psychiatrists who worked mostly with children and adolescents and looked at the best school places for them, some going into the schools, some coming out of the schools. It was challenging in the sense that resources were few yeah. but we did it we started it and hoped that it would increase and perhaps has now I, I'm not familiar really with what's going on now yeah. but education is, has always been in a state of flux um, seemingly more so now than ever yeah. but isn't that what it and I'm, I'm, I'm moving away from this subject but I want to ask that because you said it education is always in a state of a flux isn't that the way it should be though we shouldn't be stagnant or well it depends on what the flux is okay right. um, if it's towards the betterment of life for its constituents who are the students then great but if it means that we're not seeing any real progress, I mean, if I look at the system now, and one of the things that I don't like to say I prophesied, but I recognized when I was in Senate that once education was being reformed in the manner in which it was going to be reformed, we were going to run in some real social problems. Social in the sense that anybody who could afford to send their kids to private school would do so. And it would leave in the public school all, or at least most, of the children who needed help. Now that doesn't mean all the children who are in no, school need help. No, absolutely not, it sure doesn't. <laughs> but what it means is it's going to tie up a lot of the resources um, that are necessary for running education. Yeah, and you see that now. You, well, that's you said what it. has happened. You say that. You see that now with student services and all this, all they this have services. They very that heavy load. Yeah, they do. Um, they really do have a heavy load. But what is worse is we're not preparing the best for all of the kids because the time has to be spent. I mean, we keep hearing teachers talking about how their time is spent having to discipline this one or that one or the other. Central must have had that back when I was there in the 30s, in the 40s. What happened? There's so much we could talk about in terms of that because the community was different back then. You couldn't Very get away different. with, you Very couldn't different. be bad at Central yes. and think you're going home and get, and yes. you're going to be you know, rewarded with time on the television and the Xbox and I really sound. <laughs> but when you look yeah. at, at the village yeah. that raised children back then yeah. and the village that doesn't exist in that yeah. form, yeah. there were common values. Yeah, yeah. You know, one other thing, amazing thing about your life is 
and talking with you and reading about you is at some point you were teaching, you were married, children, and then decide I'm going away to become a doctor of psychology. First woman, first, first woman doctor of psychology, um, black woman. Um, what, what, how'd you do that? <laughs> what year was that? It was... I went away in 1970. Yeah. And you uh, took the kids by this time? I mean, yes. Uh, well, you see what? <laughs> Moving around with family planning and whatnot is um, something that has to take place very early. And when I, I married quite young, the first time, um, you notice I named, I use the name Astwood. I'm also Lady Blackman. Yes. But I use Astwood in Bermuda. Everybody who knows me in Bermuda knows me as Astwood, so I don't necessarily use Blackman. But the, uh, I married at 23. I, w I had just finished teacher's college and first year of my degree and decided I can't have any kids until I finish my first degree. Additionally, my mother had threatened me with not getting married so young but finishing the degree. And I promised her that that would not be an impediment to getting a degree that would probably, I'd probably do better. I wouldn't be dating every night and I could stay at home and study, which happened in, in some, re, some ways. But I also said to her, I'll get a doctorate, so don't worry. She, she, she kind of laughed at that. Um, didn't expect that to happen. But I finished the first degree and went off to England for a year, husband until at that stage. Um, and we came back and of course we had no cage in which to put the birds if we had any. <laughs> so we decided we'd better uh, build a house. So we did that and then had the three kids. Uh, and when the youngest one was two, um, we were ready for me to take off to, to study for my doctorate. And he, you went my to husband England. was really very helpful okay. you know, yeah. in, in looking after the kids. Mm -hmm. He went to school too, mm -hmm. but his schedule was quite different right. from mine, and he was able to oversee that. Yeah, so, so you had three children, Yeah. and you went off to what? what where? I went to Adelphi in New York. In New York, oh, okay. So which was a, then one yeah. of the best professional right. schools, School. still is, yes. for psychology. Yeah. Very good. And I had the privilege to do my internship at Harvard uh, in the medical school. Excellent. So I interned in one of the hospitals, mm. well, two of them, yeah. off and on. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Dr. Asso, we have to wrap this up, but and it's been, I, we could go on. So much, I want, so much else I want to ask you, so many things. But I just want to know from you, um, you have given back to Bermuda so much in terms of educating and being there for families and children uh, with learning disabilities and behavioral and the work. Um, and your work in the Senate, we didn't even touch that, that your work in the Senate. What motivates you? What did it, what has pushed you? What is, what's driven you? I'm probably hyperactive. I mm. like doing. Yeah. I like being busy. Right. And those were things that enable me to fulfill some of my needs too. Yeah, okay. Good. We appreciate you. I'm very, you. very thankful that you took some time out today to come and be with us. And we look forward to hearing more and more. You're not finished. I know you got, I know. <laughs> I, I, I feel it. I, I don't know, a book? Have you written a book? No. Uh, Most of what I've done cannot be written. Yeah. But someone could put some paper to pen. <laughs> someone could, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Norman Asler, thank you so much. And thank you for joining us on this edition, Bermuda Through Our Eyes.